So, hi, I'm Will Iverson, and I am the founder of Double Robot, which is a solo game development studio. So, uh, we'll probably have a link to the trailer or something, and ba- everything you see in that trailer is either an asset that I got or something I built myself. So, there you go. So, how in the world am I doing games now? How did this happen? So um, I guess the short version of it is I started programming when I was a kid. I was like 10. And what I want, what I actually wanted to make was spaceship games back in the day. So that's literally how I taught myself first on basic. And then I did Pascal for a while. And I was literally making games on my Mac that were like spaceship games. So then what happened was, um, I wound up going to Silicon Valley and working at Apple and Symantec for a while. And I was part of the very first people who were working with Java. So I was actually building uh, Java development tools. And so that sort of then led to this sort of pivot over time, which then turned into consulting. So I did that for many years, which is where we met. And uh, had a consulting company um, that I was uh, one of the co-founders of for several for six years and um that company you know we were doing things like building the back ends for really large web services like one of our first big clients was actually a medical or uh, group health it was one of the big um health care delivery and insurance systems and i mean i was literally looking at what we were building and i'm like I'm literally working on insurance systems right now, my share of the company, and had a chance to kind of say, okay, well, what do I want to do next? And so that's when I looked at a bunch of different things and said, hey, I'm going to go back into doing the thing that I did when I first started, which was working on games. And so that's kind of how in this big, weird, circular story circle kind of way, it's like you return to where you started. Um, So that's what led to me getting into the game space. Cool. Very good. Screwed up my I hid, hid my notes. Get back your notepad. There we are. Awesome. <clears throat> good in, good intro. Um, okay. So, Will, you also are a writer. So, why did you build this? This well, first describe what you're what you're building, and then why are you doing that instead of a book? Sure. So, uh, well, it's funny. You know, when somebody says I'm a writer, what does that mean, right? So, for me, my um. I, I started really writing a lot back in school and I was a political science major and that, that was all about being able to, you know, produce tons of material very, very quickly at a, at a reasonable quality. Um, uh, back in the early 2000s, I wrote four and published four different um, technology books. So I wrote two for O'Reilly and two for Pearson's and they were... Uh, like web services and hibernate and very technical topics. And that was when I first got a chance to really experience, I guess, the the life of the writer, where it's like I would get up every day and I would go write for six hours a day. Um, So I I did that for about a year. Um, And when I started, it was like, hey, this is awesome. I'm sitting in coffee shops all day and I'm working away. And and by the end, I was kind of going a little stir crazy because it's just me and my laptop in coffee shops all day long. Um, so I had some familiarity with writing a book. Now, when it came down to doing a game, um, it was like, I, well, I knew I wanted to tell a story because that's the thing that provides the emotional hook for making the game interesting. Otherwise, it's like it's just Tetris or something, right? So... Um, that then led to me developing a workflow for how to create a story game. So um, a lot of video games, it's you're getting this really, and this this is actually a huge topic of like how do you deliver deliver narrative story in the context of a game, right? And one model for that is something that winds up looking kind of like a choose your own adventure book, right? You get to pick your paths, the characters you talk to, and then you get to go down and explore. So um, 
effectively what I wound up doing, and I didn't really get a chance to sit down and do that, like I'm just going to sit and write a lot of material up until about two months ago. And I wound up writing about 13,000 words for the game. And so it's basically a lot more like a movie script. Um, so sitting here today, having gone through that experience, um, I basically wrote the uh, same amount of material that would be involved in writing a two hour movie script. And so in a lot of ways, I feel like that's what I was writing because it's right. I'm writing natural dialogue that, um, then has an interaction. So, so I guess it's more like, I feel like I'm doing script writing than I am doing like traditional, um, especially extended novel writing, um, one of the questions that we talked about earlier was, well, why, why write a book or why, why make a game instead of just writing a book? And I think one of the, the challenges, so for one, a typical book might be 80 to 120,000 words, right? It's like a pretty reasonable no novel length. Um, and then the marketing and the distribution and everything it, that's a very well-known space right like you write the book you can self-publish it through amazon and create space if you want or um, you can work with a traditional publisher um, and that's a lot of time just writing and then producing the material and one of the questions for me would be like okay well if i'm going to do that how would i do something that would be unique right the game space is not as crowded in my opinion i think there's a lot fewer um, like if I was going to sit there and say, to you, say, okay, how many, you know, multi-hour science fiction role-playing games are on the market right now? I mean, you're talking less than, I don't know, 20 at most. I mean, I can, I could hardly even think of it even more than a handful. Um, there's a couple of AAA, incredibly expensive, big budget ones that have come out over the last few years. But if somebody says, hey, I want to play a space role-playing game, right? There's only maybe a handful of them that you can even find on the Steam store. So compare that to like if I wanted to write a science fiction novel, how many of those are out right, right now? Like I, I have no idea, but a lot more than that. Like thousands and thousands, <laughs> multiple thousands. Right. And then on top of that, like I'm a, I'm a science fiction fan, right? So when I'm writing this game, I'm sitting here and I'm able to draw on everything from E.E. E. Doc Smith, 1930s stuff, to much more contemporary things like um, Alistair Reynolds or um, Cor Corey Expanse stuff, um, or you know, science fiction shows like Babylon 5 was a huge thing for me back in the day. And so... Um, the thing that's crazy is like as far as books go, you can pick up a book that was written decades ago. Like I, I, I actually read Caves of Steel for the first time in the last 10 years, which is like a famous Asimov book. Man, that book holds up phenomenally well today. I mean, you can read it and you're like, man, it feels like it, 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 it's addressing stuff that we're dealing with right now. Video games um, – there are a lot of classic science fiction games out there. Like there's, you know, Star Control or one of the big inspirations for me was Escape Velocity. Um, but those games are almost impossible to find and to play, right? So if I, if I say, hey, you know, Lance, check out Caves of Steel, you can go up on Amazon and buy it right now and it's awesome. If I say, hey, go check out Escape Velocity, it's going to be, you can't even, I mean, the publisher's out of business, like... You know, you're going to be poking around on Reddit threads trying to find an old version that you have to fire up in an emulator. Like, I mean, what platform was it on? Escape Velocity uh, was uh, by a guy. I think it's uh, Escape Velocity. I played originally on the Mac, oh. um, and they did eventually port it to Windows, um, so you could play it on both. I think the guy's name was Matt Birch that wrote it. Um, okay. Yeah. We're talking like Mac Power PC or Mac. Uh, uh, oh, uh, I SE? think. It, uh, what era are we talking here? Um, it was like Mac. I think it was playable on the 68K Max, and it was, but it was in color. I, I don't think it ran on a on the 512 um, black and whites, but it definitely ran like I think on a Mac LC, so like a color. Yeah. 
machine. Cool. Yeah, I've had I've had flights of nostalgia. Sometimes going back to to get my Commodore sixty four games as well and and things like that. So, and I think it's because the games I remember the most were either story driven or they just were really fun with another person. And like uh, I think of EA Winter Games was really awesome as well. So, uh, uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I think well, what's what's funny is like even Escape Velocity. So the original was written, um, and it's it's funny to me because I could go back and I'll check out some of those games, and and they the older games like Morrowind, you know, the Elder Scrolls Morrowind game is the same way where they're very comfortable just throwing like three paragraphs of text up on the screen and expecting you to read all of it. Yeah. Um, and so in modern games, it's people the the expectation is is that you'll have like voice actors and then they'll talk through the dialogue it's not necessarily paragraphs of of reading um which is which really affects how you write um like so so when i was writing and that's where i come back to that bit about scripts um the material i'm writing right now for this game it's complicated because it's got to be dialogue that's short and terse and then also and deliver a lot of information very very efficiently like you know it's like two sentences you know um it, and then i'll i will be using voice actors um the uh so every every line of dialogue that the characters speak will be recorded audio that then i have to then hook into the game to play as well which is pretty wild cool okay so i'm gonna i think we got that one uh just a quick uh the sun coming in is reflecting off your glasses heavily. Oh, let me, let me, let me, let's, maybe we can improve the, the visual. So you got me thinking about the visual. I'm going to turn on my studio. I missed a light here. Hang on a second. I'll do this something. Oh, how's that? There we are. Actually, actually don't awesome. let me see. Uh, bring up the Skype. Oh, there we go. Yep. And okay. Your, is that... your gigabit Ethernet's doing very well. I'm not getting any. Usually, I, I sometimes I can't always hold video through these things, but uh, yeah. I've been cool. Is that better? It. Yeah. Well, yeah. That way, you know what I mean. I'm just trying to make you look, make you look spiff for the for the video one. <laughs> <sighs> Yeah, well. All the monitors reflecting in there. I don't know if we can fix this with glasses, unless you. Oh yeah, if you. I can turn the brightness down. The, uh, you know, it's the old bit, right? If I'm, as long as I can get by on my looks, I guess I'm doing okay. <laughs> uh, all right. I have a Logitech keyboard, not the standard Apple one. So let me brightness. Well, There we go. Oops. Oh, that helps a lot, actually. Whatever you did. There we go. How's that? Yeah, better. Yes. Yes. You know, it's not perfect, but hey, you know, we have to plan ahead, and you probably couldn't do it in front of a. Well, you'd have to have better, different lighting or something. I'm not sure. Anyways, it's pretty good. Okay, so so we got some stuff about story. Let's go down to, and you talked about the barrier to entry is higher for games already. So let's talk about. Um, oh, you talked about technical erosion as well. So let's talk a little bit about your platform. What is Unity, and is it open source? Yeah, so um, there's this huge world of, of uh, game development engines, right? Um, basically, if you think about it, it's like you've got the core computer and its operating system, and then there's these graphic layers on top that exist that are how you talk to a video card, right? And so... Uh, the video cards nowadays, there's a whole bunch of different languages and tools that you can talk to them. And you've probably maybe seen some of those reference like OpenGL or Metal or DirectX, right? And then there's this whole nother layer of software that's a game engine. And that's basically all the things between the code that as a game developer you want to write and, and this video, the video cards. And the audio and input are also factors too. And so when I first started uh, doing game development, I, as a Java developer, I started working with a tool called libgdx, which is an open source Java-based framework for making games. And it's really cool. And you can make a lot of stuff with it. Um, but And I learned a lot because it was open source. So I was able to go through and, and play with it. 
there's a couple of others for other platforms and languages. There's one called Raylib that's really nice if you're a C, C++ developer. There's um, a bunch of other C Sharp ones as well. The reason I wound up going with Unity, um, two, two or three, one of them was almost all of the other tools do not support all the platforms. So what I mean by that is uh, I want to be able to write a game where I can, I can write it once and I can run it on Macs, PC, Linux, Xbox, PlayStation, Nintendo, Switch, ever, all the things that people play games on. And basically the only tool that's got really wide set, widespread support for all of those platforms is Unity. Uh, there is a free version of Unity, but um, I did go ahead and spring for the commercial license for it. The um, so so basically at the most base prim, fundamental level, if if I make a game and I can't ship it, then why did I bother? Almost right. There's one other engine, Unreal, which is also vi also in that space and viable. Uh, Part of it is also there's a ton of tools that exist in Unity that aren't in some of these other frameworks and tools. So, for example, let's take LibGDX, which is the Java framework. Um, you have a ton of control, but you're writing everything by hand in code. So if you want to lay out a user interface, if you want to do animations, if you want to do particle effects, you're writing code for everything. Whereas with Unity, like... I, let's say I want to animate something. I just attach an animation component to it. I can bring in a 3D model, and then I can wire it up with the controller. And like I have space aliens that fly around, and they look creepy cool. And I was able to, with Unity, go up on the asset store, buy the model, pull it into the game, and then animate it and have it working that afternoon. Nice. So Unity, okay. So Unity came with the functionality where it sounds like the Java one was like an interface strategy to you had to fill out the interfaces to 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 get the the, the things you need to do done. And uh, is Unity open source? Nope, Unity is not open source. Uh, you can download it for free though. So if you're a developer and you want to get started, you can. I mean, it's free and schools use it. There's a ridiculous amount of educational material on how to use it. Um, that was actually one of the big shifts for me is my, my standard learning. My model is to read a book, right? And that was one of the biggest shifts that I had to go through. And it was very deliberate was to start watching like tons of video tutorials on how to do things like visual effects and camera work and lensing and all that fun stuff. Yeah. So, but yep. So was it a uh, tell, tell me about that ship? Was it uncomfortable or was it just a, a surprising? Uh, why was it a shift at all? Why wasn't it just like? Yeah. So so the 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 learning shift. So everybody has different preferred learning models, right? Like some people like classroom settings. Some people like to read. Some people like to watch video. Um, I've read books that talk about anywhere from seven to eleven different kinds of intelligence that people have. So like kinesthetic intelligence is an example of something where you've, I mean, we might, we, you may have known somebody who was able to just like, you could, they could do a dance move and then the other person can replicate it almost instantly the first time. Right. So all these different kinds of intelligence. So the trick for me is that what I found is that I am a, one of my least favorite learning models is actually classroom. Um, and that's cause I'm very, I get very impatient. I'm like, come on, talk faster, do it quicker, whatever. Uh, so that's why I would gravitate towards books. Um, and, and very early on I found, you know, somebody would say like they would, I remember this is actually really funny. I, I was in a meeting, uh, back in like the mid nineties, one of my first jobs. Right. And they were talking about how do people learn how to use the class library that is shipped with the development tool. And, the they were doing a poll they, they in the meeting and they asked everybody well how did you learn the, the framework and i said well i just read the reference manual it was like a 400 page manual with every component and everything in it right and they were like what do you mean and i said well i just read the manual i just started at the beginning in page one and i read through all 400 pages and that was a big part of how i learned how to use the tool in the framework and i remember the room got really quiet and <laughs> 
And I didn't understand Stranger why. Stranger danger happened. <laughs> yeah, and I didn't understand. And it was like, oh, that one of those moments. Where I'm like, oh, I'm really weird that yeah. way. You like right? RTFM. Yeah, I do. Like Java in the Nutshell, I yeah. would read that from beginning to end. Yeah. I, I would read all those books, right? Um, same thing with Unity. So it's like, okay, well, I'm going to learn how to use Unity. So I would just, I bought like six books on Unity and I would read them from beginning to end. And what I found was that the the document that the tools and the frameworks for all the visual stuff were very very much like drag and drop components and editing curves and editors and moving things around and the problem is is that technical material like learning how to li how a code library works you can read and you can understand it but the problem is if it's like reading documentation that says things like drag and drop this thing onto that thing is really painful and hard and doesn't work very well because you're not actually getting the associations in your mind. Yeah. So what I started doing was at some point I realized that, that I could keep reading books, but I wasn't going to make any progress and I had to start watching the videos. <laughs> so what, what I would do is, um, I would like my, you know, my son would go to sleep and then it would be like, I'd have that time in the evening, for example. And I could just watch YouTube on my, on the Apple TV hooked up to my big screen TV, or I would, could watch YouTube videos on my computer and then I could set them to run at one and a half or two X speed. And that was so much nicer, you know, yeah. being, just go through it. Um, Right now, uh, so I've, I feel really pretty comfortable working with Unity. I've got all of the tools and the components. There's basically most of the guts of it. I'm at least somewhat familiar with how it works at this point. So what I'm doing is I'm doing the same thing with Blender right now, oh, yeah. which is a 3D modeling tool, right? And I mean, that thing's huge. You could spend a lifetime learning all the different ins and outs on that tool. And it gives me some way to sort of scratch that itch of like, I want to keep learning and keep growing and keep doing stuff um, while also... Uh, um, <laughs> you know, balancing out my learning styles. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> what do you do in your building your models in? Do you use Blender for building your 3D models? Actually, the for the game, part of the whole reason. So, the game. I guess I should start with just a real like, what the heck is the game, right? Sure. So, the original pitch for the game was just Asteroids, the role playing game. Right. So you have little spaceships and they fly around and they blow stuff up. And then the idea was to also tell a story like a choose your own adventure story. So that was the really the original pitch it was really simple. Um, and fortunately, it turns out that you can get tons of those kinds of assets, especially photorealistic ones off the asset stores. So I have like little um, kit bash kits. So basically what you can do is you can take uh, kits of spaceships that you can download the assets for, and then you can glue them to, and then you can stick them together. So it's almost like a 3D right. bag of parts, and you just stick them together, and Legos. voila. Right. Yeah. Um, and so what that meant was is that I was able to add in. There's uh, like 60 playable ships in the game. You know, alien spaceships, fighters, capital ships, all that stuff. Hmm. Uh, there's comets and asteroids and, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff. And I was able to put all that in without having to do my own 3D modeling. Nice. Um, so then part of what I'm doing with Unity is there's a bunch of things that I want to put into the game um, for, like, the end boss. Like, you know, creepy looking alien fragments of space stations that have blown up and stuff. Um, that's called hard surface modeling, and it's, I think, a little easier to do in, in, uh, for somebody. And so basically, I'm just, I can build the models, and then I can throw textures on it and have it look pretty good. Oh, okay. So the uh, complicated models you bought off on the, on the on market, and then later you'll need some, some maybe simpler models that you'll build on your own. Yeah, and part of it is, is, is the, by going through the process, um, so let's okay. So let's just take 3D modeling for a second, just to, to to kind of walk through how stupidly complicated it can be. So you have a, you have a, let's say you want to make a 3D model. You have a mesh, right, which is just 3D points in space with vertices. Then you have normals, which is which direction is each face pointing, and then you can then attach UV textures, um, which are basically 2D texture data that you can apply to the mesh, which can give it 
colors and shapes and reflectivity and and uh, bumping bumping on it and all this stuff. And so let's just say you want to make a chair. And so now I've got the mesh for the chair. I might have the colors of the chair with the the, the woodwork on it. Maybe I want to add detail and grime so it looks all all bumpy. You could spend two days building one chair. One chair, right, right. Right. So what I've been doing is, is I go and I pull down these assets off the asset store, and then I'll, I'll hack them, right? I will, um, for example, uh, I've got asteroids, right? So I've got these asteroids where they're lava asteroids and electric electricity asteroids and stuff, right? <laughs> wow. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll take the asteroids' textures. So I do this thing right now, like when a sh when you blow up an enemy ship, right? Yeah. Um, what I do is I swap the texture out on the enemy ship from whatever it shipped with to the lava asteroid texture. Oh, okay. Okay. So now it looks all like glowing red and black and kind of effed up and right. Oh. So that's not like if I was a 3d modeler and I was really professional about it, I might look at that and go, Oh man, you are totally cheating because you're taking <laughs> that thing and throwing it on that thing. But, you know, at the yeah. end of the day, it looks good. And I'm, I'm saving texture data because I'm reusing the same textures in lots of places and whatever. And it's this weird fusion of visual arts and hack low-level technical stuff. And Let's talk about, okay, now, um, do you do any test automation? Ooh, so this is a really interesting space. So, so test automation in games is, is a really fascinating space because, like, my background for, for gosh, the last 20 years was doing server side stuff, right? And if you're building REST services in 2020 and you don't write automated tests, you're, you're kind of, in my opinion, a little crazy. Um, and that's part of the tools and the frameworks make it so nice and easy. Like if I want to write a West REST service that's going to stress test hitting some data service, it's like, cool, I can, here's some inputs I want to test, here's some outputs, easy, straightforward. Game developers don't do that. They don't have any kind of sense of, of writing tests or TDD or any of that. Um, that is not the way that they teach how to do games. And I think there's a couple of really basic reasons for it. Like one of them is the most fundamental questions for games are often things like, is it fun? Does it look good? Right? Those are things that are very difficult to write tests for. Right. Um, so then there you ha a typical game developer might be hacking really, really fast, trying to make something really quick and dirty. And they're trying to the goal is to get to the fun place or get to the good looking place. Um, so when I sat down to make this game, one of the things that made it really weird was I knew I wanted to write this story. Right. So I've got missions and quests and items and spaceships and all this stuff. So the guts of the game, all of the parts, the role-playing game things, um, that's all actually written in C Sharp in a command line project mm. that has a ton of automated tests. So what that means is, is that I can run through every single quest in the game, every single item that the players can pick up, every single monster that they can fight, and I've got automated tests that run for all that. Mm. And it's just C Sharp, I'm using X unit, it's like straightforward, easy peasy. That's probably three quarters of the game is in that code. And then I basically treat Unity as a view layer. And so it's the graphics and it draws things on top. And Unity does have um, some support for writing automated tests in it. So I have some integration, what I would characterize as integration tests that I've written in Unity. And it's kind of like the old app servers. It's big, it's fat, they're ugly. Um, the tests have a lot of um, like multi-threaded yielding and waiting in them. So like if you've ever done Selenium testing where you're trying to sit and you're waiting for things to happen a lot because you're waiting for the browser to do DOM stuff, there's a lot of parallels there. You know, it's it's I'm writing uh, these really weird tests. So I'm able to do it. And I'm, I do that especially for a lot of um, validation between the visual layer and the uh, – the back end that things are hooked up. So for example, like, you know, there's a hundred items in inventory and every one of them needs a sprite to draw in the inventory. Do the sprites exist or will it 
not. So that way, if I've got some cr- something that could blow up later, it's cool. So that strategy has worked really, really well. I took the, sh- the game to the PAX East, which is a trade show, about two months ago. And the game ran on a you know Razer laptop for the entire show for four days straight. Uh, didn't crash once. So you mentioned uh, now you're mentioning going to a show and you mentioned pitching. Um, tell me about that. Like, why do you need to do these activities? Why are you going to the trade show? Why? What, what is the value you're there to get? Yeah. Well, uh, the the short version is to to act as a um, a way to validate that what I'm doing is not crazy, right? So so I guess uh, let me back up a little bit. So about three years ago is when I first uh, start, decided to switch into gaming. And I started, a lot of that first two years was just learning how to use the tools and the frameworks and stuff. And that's another whole story in itself. Um, about a year ago, almost exactly, I took the show to the Game Developer Conference in San Francisco. And it was basically just a prototype, and I literally just made a trailer. So I made the prototype in Unity, and then I took a trailer with me to the, to the game developer conference. And I showed it to a bunch of the people at, at like Xbox and Sony and Nintendo and stuff, and I basically said, you know, what do you guys think? So and you they said – your laptop to their table, or do they come to your yeah. event or – no, I just brought I just brought my phone. Oh, yeah, phone. I, oh, okay. Yeah, and I would just grab people at the show, and I'd be like, "Hey, I'm working on a game. What do you think?" And <laughs> then, would you want it? I I was talking to people who were the people at those those companies that are responsible for actually um, publishing games. Okay. Right. So they weren't just like randos. I mean, I I would do that too, but um, <laughs> they were they were people who who were the ones managing the pipelines of the games, oh, right? Yeah. And I said you know, here's this thing I'm working on. Do you guys think it would be cool? And they all said, yeah. And I said, okay, you know, do you guys see a ton of games in that space? No. You know, is this something that you think would have some legs? Yeah. So that was a good validation. And then going to PAX at the end of February, that's a video game show. It's like one of the biggest shows in the world. There's PAX Prime in Seattle, which may or may not happen this year, this fall. I don't know. Um, but the point of that was to have a booth and to get – we probably had a couple hundred people walk through that booth. I mean the booth was busy nonstop for four days. At one point, we had a line with about 10 people waiting to play the game. And you know, people – we'd hand the controller to people and ask them what they thought. And that's you know very valuable feedback as a developer on what works, what doesn't. Do people like it? We got a – a whole bunch of people wish listed the game right after that. So people would play it. I'd say, Hey, you can go up on steam and you can wish list it. And then a lot of them would do it right off their phone while they're saying they'd be like, yeah, I'd buy this game. Um, so that was huge. Um, you know, the, the part that's a bummer is if you're just sitting in your, in your office all day working on this thing and you have no idea if anyone will care or want to play it. Right. right. So getting to show it off and having feedback, you know, what works, what doesn't like one of the, the game has a camera in it that is very dynamic and moves around a lot, you know, and for 99% of the people who walked by, um, they thought it was awesome and it looked really cool and everything. And we had like a, you know, there's one woman who was like, oh, I get it's making me motion sick. And the one other person who's reported that's actually my wife. Wow. So now I, I put in a button that you can hit that calms the camera down. So I sort of joke that it's like the default is the Battlestar Galactica version, and then you can hit a button to turn it into Star Trek mode where oh, the game is really – so. We have a momentum control or what's it called? Momentum uh, control yep. or whatever the sh- is in the ship. Yep. Cool. Well, that's nice. Yeah, systems of feedback. These are things that are harder to do with books as well. I think it's possible, but, but uh, a lot of authors are sort of introverted, so they don't find ways to pitch their book ideas to their friends and get feedback. But with a game – Anyone will be interested in looking at it, at least a video, because it'll catch their eye. And then you even have this this booth uh, set up, so so uh, you got people to play it. Uh, is that is that pretty expensive, by the way? So you had to invest something in, into this. It sounds like. Yeah, I mean, expensive is relative. You know, I mean, it was like, you know, the booth was only wasn't that expensive. It was like a grand for the booth, and then, um, you know, I had. Uh, two people come with me to help out on the show and I, you know, covered their hotels and bought nice dinners for them and stuff. They were nice enough to, 
to just want to come and get to hang out and get to go to PAX and stuff. So, um, so I mean, it was it was not like nothing. I mean, I guess, but it's all relative, right? Is a couple grand to do a trade show expensive or not? I don't know that that. Yeah, it all depends. For, yeah, I mean, uh, to put it another way, we got enough pre-orders that if the pre-orders convert the way that they typically convert according to industry standards, um, the show paid for itself. Nice. So, yeah. So this is – now we're entering this uh, area called uh, incremental delivery and fast experiments. So when you put yourself back in time where you're thinking about doing this, you know, I'm going to invest some time and I might use Unity and I might use this and I might use that. Uh, did you do any type of lean startup experiments to see if – to test your idea before you started investing in building technology? Yeah. Well, what's funny is, is that um, – and I, I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. So I spent like two years working on stuff before I can't before I switched to this Asteroids the RPG concept. Blaze Guy, right, is the name of the game. Um, so I built probably at least half a dozen games, and then I would build them, put them in people's hands. Some of them were mobile games that I deployed to the iOS and Android app stores. Um, so I built and then shot at probably half a dozen games. Um, and so that, that was part of actually what also then wound up pushing me towards unity was because, uh, without visual tools, it, the cycle between building, having an idea and building a minimum prototype that I could have somebody play with was too long. Um, the irony is like today, if somebody said, oh, build those prototypes, like with unity, I could knock out something that took me three months to do before and probably a week, which is a really it's just learning in life. Um, so yeah, as far as the the asteroids, the RPG concept goes, part of the tension there is like how much material do you have to put out to then test at what stage, right? So like the prototype that I did a year ago, where it was like quick and dirty, that took you know six weeks to hack it together, and then I shot the trailer, and then I brought it and got some people to play. Um, Today, the game is available, or the, I have posted the game on Steam. And so my testers, I can push out a new build like once ever. I mean, I could do it as often as I want. It's I've got some scripts, and it's not too bad. Um, so I can push out builds pretty much as often as I want, and then I can get feedback from them. So the process is I use... I build it in Unity. I use GitHub for source control. Um, I've got headless automated tests that run for the guts of it unity tests that run and then i'm able to push it out and deploy it the the kick is is that there's this whole aspect around the marketing side that takes a lot of time and and there's no way to automate and the specific example of that that i'll give you is um i need to cut a new trailer right so the way it works is is that i have the game and it runs on my pc and i run it in 4k and i use the built-in hardware recorder to generate video. And then I can generate, let's say, pick a figure, half an hour of gameplay video. And I'll have a shot list for all the things I want to catch. Like, oh, new missiles, new particle effects. The shields look cool now. The spaceship's got new glow in, on the engines that look gorgeous. Um, you know, I've added in a sort of a camera mode where you can take cool pictures, right? Like all the fun stuff. Okay, so I take 30 minutes, 45 minutes, whatever of footage. Then I pull that over onto Final Cut on my Mac, and then I can edit all that down to a minute-long, two-minute-long trailer. I have to add and pick out the music, check the sound, all that fun stuff. So that takes, like, probably easily a day, right? So, you know, how often do I do that? Because that's a day <laughs> I'm not spending building the game, right? Right. Um, so fortunately, the game, the one good thing about this virus and everybody being stuck at home is that a lot of the things I used to do, like go out for lunches a lot with friends to catch up and stuff, or, you know, I've got to go pick up my son from school. Um, a lot of the, that time that I was spending, I, I don't have to do now. So I'm actually a, getting pretty close to this thing being at least an early access. I, I said it was going to be summer at PAX. And it's now May, and I'm putting, I'm feeling a lot more done than not done. So, wow, okay, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, I'll have to follow up with you on something later. Uh, so let's see here. So your cheapest experiment was sounds like one month of development to get the asteroid game part uh, parts working, and then you uh, invited people to watch the video, or you had them play it. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, well, actually, I mean, technically, I think as far as this this game goes, I probably only took about a couple days to get a controller hooked up to a spaceship that could fly around and shoot and blow up asteroids mm. right so, so at that point the experiment is can will build a game at all and that's you, you showed something and you go great I can, I can build a game so that experiment check past the hypothesis is, is yes i can do this yes exactly okay i mean and it's funny like you know part of it is when i started the experiment one of my goals was to say, how much of this can I get away with not writing code for? Uh, right. So like unity has all these systems built in it for things like AI pathfinding and controller input and, you know, graphics and particle effects and stuff. And so part of it was like with libgdx, it was like, Oh, you want to, you know, move the ship, 20 pixels it's like you go in and you write code that says move it 20 pixels mm -hmm. so the initial experiments that i did were using something called the unity nav mesh which was a pathfinding system mm -hmm. so i was literally like just taking the input from the controller and then feeding it back into the ai pathfinder to move the ship around and stuff so it was like really 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 like simple basic stuff what wound up happening was, is after I, I did that for a while, was eventually I wound up switching to using the physics engine to drive the ship. And that was because I wanted to have things like, there were a couple of points in time where a specific thing changed in the game that really notched it up. Um, so when I switched it to physics, all of a sudden, instead of it like the ships just sort of moving around like a little pin on stuck to a piece to a, to a, a board, mm. all of a sudden now when I like when the ship would like hit an asteroid, it would spin around and the camera would whip around, and it felt like you were watching an action movie. Yes. So cha changing that camera around, a um, couple of the visual changes. Like originally, I had the camera on up, up above. So, like, if you think about asteroids, asteroids, you look down at, like, the old 19-whatever 80s game, like, right? You look down, and there's a little ship in the center, and it moves around, and then it shoots the asteroids. Um, so the camera is, like, a god view. Yeah. It's looking down. One of the changes I made was to instead put the camera behind the ship, so now the camera is like a chase camera. Mm. So like if you think about like you're watching a, a car racing sequence in a vid in a movie where it's like the camera is like in part of it, like following the car and the camera is a body. Mm -hmm. So even though it's CG, it doesn't exactly isn't real. The camera has body and weight to it. And so like when the when the ship's flying around, it's moving and the camera's moving. So a couple of those changes made me go, oh, hey, this is actually not just, you know. There's actually like a really fun gameplay thing. The other one that I did um, was I. Uh, are you familiar with Mastermind at all? Um, so this idea of having somebody to check in with for accountability. Oh, mastermind groups, yes. Yeah. So uh, I wound up finding this guy who helped me out. He was an industry guy who's he's worked in games for a long time, and basically I would I would check in with him once every two weeks. Cool. And we would we would meet, and I'd show him the build, and he'd play it, and he'd give me his thoughts and his oh. feedback, and it was very motivating for me because it was like, okay, you know, I need to show the 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 build to this guy, yeah. right? And so I have to add add new features, and I want it to work well, and it's not going to crash, and all that fun stuff. Um, one of the things that, because and this is probably because of some of the background doing the agile development stuff. The game, I, I always keep the game in a buildable, playable state. So I never have the game, like even if I'm adding a new feature or whatever, it, it, it's always playable, it's always working, always moving forward. Which is a side note, is actually a very unusual thing in game development. Lots of games will be in practically unplayable states for the vast bulk of their development process, which I find blows, which I find insane, but that's a very common thing. Right. 
Yeah, no, I, 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 different industries, they have different uh, adoption rates or flexibility to focusing on things outside of their specific, like, one. It's like a narrow focus. I just want to build a game without thinking about engineering excellence and these other items. But uh, that sounds really cool that you did that. How many unit tests are, do you have, or how many tests do you have in your suite? There are... I mean, well, it's funny because the meaning and the granularity of these things is a little little odd. Um, like, I'm not even sure if it's a meaningful statistic, to be honest, but I'd say I probably have in the in in the explorer so i use writer for development it's the c sharp ide from from JetBrains. Oh, don't so um uh, yeah so JetBrains makes uh intellij which is the java development environment that most people use and then they've got like a they actually have platform specific ides for a lot of other tools um so i'm using the c sharp one which has a ton of features in it for unity um so i'd say i have about 100, 120 tests that run in the headless project, and then I probably got another dozen, two do, do, somewhere between a dozen and cool. more than yeah, more than ten, less than twenty Unity tests. But a lot, but some of those tests, like they're they're testing the entire data set. Yeah. Right. So. Well, yeah, but you're following the usual the ratio, which which, you know, I, I don't know if it's quite. I've got enough data to call it a golden rule yet, but. Uh, uh, 10x increase. It should be 10 to two, 10 or 100x increase for unit tests, and then the the UI, like you need the whole system running to to execute these tests. Those should be uh, an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude less of your unit tests. So you're yep. you're kind of in that range right now. Uh, yep. All right. Let's see. Let's talk about. See, we only have about seven minutes. Let's uh, focus on story and. Uh, so tell us about the story. Oh, geez. Uh, okay, so um, the story. So, um, so, so I guess the best place to talk about story is like, well, why are you writing it? Like, what are the th what? Let's just start really broad, like thematically. Like, what are you trying to do? Yeah. So I'm a dad, right? And I there's this whole genre of fiction, um, utopian fiction. I don't know if right. Um, it goes back to the 1920s. There was a book called Looking Backwards that was written. And Looking Backwards, if you pick that book up and you read it today, it, it would be hilarious because in the book, he posits all these crazy future ideas like someday we're going to pay for things with just little cards that we use. We're going to um, – uh, that you could be in your room and have music piped in from all over the world that you could um, – that you would go to the store and you would look at products and then you would buy them and then they would be delivered to your house instead of having to take it back yourself. Like you read the book, it's, it's, you know, it's a 200, 300 page s novel story where a guy falls asleep and he wakes up a hundred years in the future. And he posits all these things, hugely influential book at the time. It was one, it was a bestseller. Yeah. Um, it led to hundreds or thousands of groups, uh, forming in the country of people getting together as clubs to talk about it and how to, how they could bring that into the world. So of course, you know, I, I'm a dad, I have my son and, and I, and I like these more optimistic stories. Like, you know, that was one of the appeals to me always about Star Trek was that for as effed up and as complicated as a bunch of things might be at the end of the day, it's got a fundamentally positive view of humanity. And and keep in mind, you know, even in Star Trek, it's like, oh, we had World War III. We screwed everything up, but we, we put it back together again, and that led to the Federation and all this good stuff. So when I was positing the story for the game, it's like, so you, you know, from a ludum perspective, like from a gameplay, it's like you're flying around in a spaceship and you're blowing stuff up. Okay, cool. I want to root this in something that feels really familiar for people. So it's humanity in the future, but an optimistic story. And as a modern science fiction person, I'm very intrigued by this notion of the singularity and like what happens to after we figure things out. So of course, inventing FTL, faster than light travel, would be a huge thing. Uh, being able to upload your consciousness to a computer is a thing. Um, what happens if you could just keep taking a, you know, a treatments and live forever, right? So there's all these singularity things. So I said, okay, well, cool. I'm going to tell the story where it's set, uh, you know, a couple hundred years in the future. 
FTL, spaceships, uh, humanity has put things together. So the core is the Terran Republic, which is you know very much inspired by things like the Federation and and Earth Alliance and whatever. So the idea is the player then can travel to visit star systems all over, about 30 different star systems, and there's other alien civilizations. Well, so what makes them interesting is to provide them essentially as a sort of a commentary. So I've got like barbarians that are sort of this sort of Anne Randian kind of like, you know, power uberalis kind of mindset. I've got a, the Proteum, which are basically computer consciousness uploads, the Archai. And so the Archai are basically this ancient species. And what they have taken to doing is they have taken over dozens of star systems. And the people who rule each star system use each star system as a way to conduct psychological and social experiments. <laughs> Right. So let's say that one one archive believes that, you know, the best way to run a society is through tight religious control. Right. So they have their world where they're like they're like the the, the god of their world and then they can unfold their society and, and conduct their experiments. Uh, so humans for each of those other groups, the Terran Republic is actually represents a threat. Right. The archive don't like the idea of, of a lesser species having FTL. Uh, the Proteum view organics as a potential threat. The Barbaroi are actually a breakaway rep breakaway from the Terrans. So I've got this big sort of space opera background with all these alien civilizations and stuff. Okay, well, cool. How do I tell that story in a way that the player is going to get? So what I did is I said, okay, I'm going to have five main characters, and those characters – go through much more like traditional character arcs that you would expect in a story. You know, they start in a place, they have conflict and challenge, and then they eventually get to a resolution. And the player is the way that they, those characters get agency. So those play, those characters give the player missions that they can then go on and then experience the world and bring back things. So the, player, each of the, the, the player is controlling one of these characters with a full background and lifestyle is that right? No, no, the player is a little bit of an enigma. Um, the player is is encounters those characters, right? So the very first one that you run into is is Commander Barnes, and he's a he's intended to be a very straightforward military analog, and he's the most most straightforward, and that his missions generally are go someplace and blow something up, right? The other characters are a diplomat a mad scientist. Um, there's a, a woman who just, her father has disappeared and she needs you to help him. Um, and then there's another one who's a scout who's all, all obsessed with the deep mysteries of space. So the way, the way it's presented to the player is you start out the game as a, um, someone who's just sold their house or their, all their life savings to be able to get a basic spaceship. <laughs> right. So you're one of the very first, it's like the very first Piper Cessna little tiny planes. So you get the first FT, one of these first sort of consumer. Yeah. Yep. And then you go on these missions and then you get rewards, which then lets you buy better ships and upgrade and stuff. And each of those characters is like a mission giver, right? So you get to encounter them. So let's take, um, let's take uh, the, the woman who's lost her father. So when you fly up to the, sta the space station that she's in, she hails you and says, hey, I need you to help me find my dad. And uh, initially the missions are to go into barbarian space and conduct scans and see if he's been abducted. And then you find out that he has actually run away to go join up with the Proteum, the computer people, right? And so basically Lee says, my hey. My dad was always very weird. I could see this. Yeah. Right, right. So then, then Lee says, like, hey, well, I need you to go find him. So then you go into the Proteum space and you explore. And then you find him. And as you go through the story, it comes out that, you know, when Lee's mother died, you know, he was very distraught about losing her. And that he believes that the Proteum and being able to upload your consciousness are a way to cheat death. For sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So then he goes back and he t and so so he says he asks the player, 
go bring Lee to me so she can upload and join me. Okay. And Lee says, I want you to bring my dad back. Right. So in, on one level, it's a, it's a science fiction story. It's like, you know, crazy uploading and robots and stuff. But every one of the character stories is, is rooted in something that ideally the player could, uh, could relate to. Right. So like, any kid who's ever gone off to college and you lose your parent, mm. right? Um, that's something that's very human and very universal and it's something that everybody deals with and how, what's the answer, mm. right? Um, so for me, part of the trick was every one of the stories, if, if it was as simple as, um, well, I, I guess I should mean that. Like, so like Barnes, you know, he's the the first sort of military guy, and his missions are really straightforward. When you start getting into the diplomat storyline or the scientist storyline, um, those get a lot more complicated, but they're not black and white, right? Um, it, the intent is that, like, let's take Lee's story, right? I hope that when the player gets to the question, when Lee finally says, you know, to the player, what should I do? Should I leave home and go join my dad and get uploaded or should I go get my dad? For me, if the player like looks at that and goes, whoo, I don't know. And maybe wants to put the controller down and walk around the block for a bit, you know, that's how I know I'm writing a good compelling story. Right. Yeah, so. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah, no, I think yeah. that's a good description. Um, okay. We should probably, do a wrap up, but I want to ask one more question before the wrap up is just, uh, what is your business model? Like, are you, uh, right now are you selling games or are you doing something else? Oh, good question. So, um, okay. So the, the business model is, um, extremely simple at this point in the sense that it's a game. You buy the game, you're done. Um, a lot of video games now do, really complicated things like in-app purchases and, and loot boxes and gotchas and all this crazy stuff. And part of that is, is that, so let's say it's a, so the list price is 30 bucks. It'll be on sale more often than not, most likely because the way these things work for like around 20 bucks, right? So if I sell, you know, 10,000 copies, that's pretty good. I'm, I'm, I'll be happy with that. And I don't have to worry about running servers. I don't have to maintain anything. I just post the files up to steam and, uh, I'm hoping plan to put it on all the consoles and I hope to also localize it to a bunch of, bunch of regions. But the idea is, is that, you know, it's a game. You go up, you buy it, you're done. Um, it is built. So all of the story, and all of the statistics for items and things like that, those are all actually just done with CSV files. Like just okay. comma separated files, you know, like it, you could edit them in Excel or technically even Notepad if you wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the idea there was that if somebody wanted to write their own stories and drop them into the game, they could. Mm -hmm. um, that, that, of course, is another whole world of people writing add-ons and mods and stuff. Um, I have a, I have a vision eventually, hopefully that where I could get to where, um, people could write their own mods. So like the old escape velocity, people would do total conversions. They would buy the game and then they would drop in a mod that like would turn the whole game into Babylon five or turn the whole game into Star Trek or Star Wars. Hmm. Um, so, you know, there's that, and then there's also another whole world of potentially other IP, right? So, like, hey, I made this thing. I personally think this would be a killer Star Trek or Star Wars platform for a game. So do I call up and talk to one of them and say, hey, I'd like to do this thing, but do it in your world? Yeah. Um, the other one is, uh, do I do, like, I've been really interested in a bunch of strategy games. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I love things like Civ and, you know, Civilization. Um, it's a really popular strategy. Game. Is there space and interest in the market for a space game kind of like this visually appeal, but instead of you're flying around in the spaceship blowing up asteroids, it's more strategic high level, like, you know, running a space empire mm -hmm. kind of stuff. Um, so I don't know. There's a, there's just a bunch of different options for where to go from here. 
And a lot of it, one of the biggest, the biggest question I don't have an answer to is just how many copies of something like this does sell, yeah. right? Um, if I sell a couple thousand copies, I'll be like, well, that was a really good, good learning experience, right? It's just like writing a book, you know? Sure. If you wrote a science fiction book and you sold 2,000 copies of it, and it took you every night and weekends for a year to write the book, do you do another one? You know. So the answer. So, but let me let me take that one for a moment. Uh, for my own studies of science fiction, you know, I would have I would actually change some things I did in the past if I knew what I knew today. And and it's this: uh, invest in the, your same readers over and over again, and your market will grow. Rather than write a one-off science fiction set in this world and a one-off science fiction set in that world, it's very hard to get. Uh, unless they're really interested in everything you write, which is hard because you're a new author, whether you're writing games or or or, or a book, uh, you would like to bring. You know, if you can grow your momentum, you would like to grow your moment, momentum rather than restart. So, uh, so my suggestion is find a way to grow your own momentum, bring your readers or your bot, your your game players into any new world by continually investing in the same. Uh, uh, universe, or maybe the platform can work as well. But if we're really doing this as high concept uh, storytelling, they're really going to be interested in the universe in that and 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 that growing rather than just the platform. Yeah, well, and it's funny. So that was part of the motivation for the story bible work that I did, and the platform, and sort of the the building of the whole world was that I wanted to support this is a place that I could tell a lot of stories, right? Like one of the funny things is, is I, from what I can tell, I think this game's probably a 10 to 30 hour gameplay experience, right? And that's depending on your point of view about right, maybe a little long for an indie game, depending. Um, the story Bible and the platform and everything was intended to support a lot more stories and let it run for a long time. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the first person to have done this, but I actually tested out a bunch of the ideas for the world in a tabletop game. I ran (laughs) a tabletop role playing game. So, um, that let me kind of see what the boundaries were. Um, like, uh, if you've heard of the great filter, right? Yep. Have you ever heard? Yeah, that's right. right? Go ahead and yeah. explain it for the audience. And, yeah. And, and, yeah. Okay, so really briefly, the question is, if you do the math and you say, well, there's so many stars in the, in the galaxy or the universe, and if a certain percentage of them all had life on them and a certain percentage of them were civilized, if you start with a really big number Drake like – Drake equation, yeah. Drake equation, exactly. Then you should have a lot of intelligent life out there. Yeah. And as far as we can tell, there's not. We're not seeing any signals. We're not, whatever, right? Right. And that begs all these questions, right? Anthropomorphic principles and all this other stuff. So a lot of science fiction, especially the really contemporary stuff, has to answer the question of where the hell is everybody else? Mm. So like in in Alistair Reynolds stuff, it he posits this this race of intelligent machines that basically goes around and reaps intelligent species that breaks a certain point, which then like the mass effect guys used that used as the basis for their story. So in my, my story, that was one of the things I, I needed to answer was like, where the hell is everybody? Right. And so for me, the answer to that was a, that just it's really hard for life to get started on its own much much harder than the drake equation would imply and one of my little hobby things is i have a little spreadsheet up on google docs and every time i read an article that talks about some horrific thing that makes it hard for life to exist i add it to the list (laughs) and uh, and i'm up to like 30 or 40 things now right like you you need a jupiter to sweep debris away you need a radiation um, protection for, with the magnetic sphere you need the sun to be the right size you need the planet to be not too um too variable in its in its orbit you need enough water on the planet that's liquid to allow the planet to form life you need the hydrothermal vents you need not to be so liquid liquid that it's an ocean world because if it's an ocean world then you can't hold things together to get like you have a lot a huge list of things. And so the problem is, is that it's almost like this reverse Drake equation, right? Yeah. 
So in my story, the idea is, is that there's just not that many intelligent life forms around, but that the archai were busy creating their their own forms of li- their own life and setting up their own planets. So one of the things that makes it work as space opera is that when the player, as part of the events of this, the archive wind up having to open up and they're going to have to admit to all of these worlds that they could have been traveling FTL all this time. So that's what, like especially in future works, acts as sort of the platform for introducing a lot of other FTL species that are also at roughly the same technology level. Because mm. like one of the things I always found a bit of a stretch was stuff like, oh yeah, the Klingons have been flying around in space for thousands of years before humans. Why the hell aren't they so advanced that they just crush everything, right? Right. Um, so I wanted to answer those things. So it's a whole okay. platform. Nice. It's a platform of storytelling. Um, so I, you, this is the uh, introduction. Go ahead and introduce yourself like we've never met you. Uh, <laughs> You know, say I am, say your name, and then a little bit about your background, and then a call to action you'd like the audience to do. Okay, perfect. Uh, So, hi, I'm Will Iverson. I'm the founder of Double Robot, an independent video game studio. Um, My background is actually, I back up. My background is in software development. I've been writing code since I was a kid. I'm 10, 10 years old. I spent many, many years doing software development consulting. And then a few years ago, I had the opportunity to be able to pivot and switch to making games. Uh, The name of my game is Blaze Sky. It's a space opera action role-playing game. So the one-liner is Asteroids, the role-playing game. It's got really good 3D graphics. Um, 4K looks beautiful, runs really well on even pretty moderately powered machines. Uh, gameplay is super easy. It's pick up and play. So even though it looks like a 3D game, screenshots that you could use as desktop patterns, really pretty. Uh, the controls are dead simple. You pick them up, fire, pick it up, easy to play, run around, blow up spaceships, have fun, and that's got a. It's not. It's a role playing game, so it's got a big story to it as well. Um, it is Blaze Sky is available for wish list on Steam today. Uh, as an indie game developer, that is the single most important thing you could do is go and wishlist the game. Um, that's basically you telling Steam that's the kind of game you'd want to play, which means that Steam would then also recommend it to other people. So, yeah, go to Steam, type in Blaze Sky, it's all one word, and add it to your wish list. Um, and then, yeah, the website for the game with more details is, is doublerobot.com. Ah. Uh.